Thank you. regular mimer class now in the afternoon we'll have a little talk about Yudal of Kislev about the significance of today's day uh, the wedding day to the Rebbe and the Rebbetson right now we'll just do continue in the mimer so we started this piece we'll back up a little bit and start again from page 158 <clears throat> The third line from the bottom. This is what it says in the writing of Ariza. Vizel Shom Ariza, Pasit Tzavas Bnei Yisrael. It says in Chumash, Tzavas Bnei Yisrael, command the Yidin. And the Ariza says, Shehub Chin Hashem Kel Adnan. That Tzav is Eile Begematria Tzadik Vav. Tzav is the Gematria numerical value 96. 96 is the same Gematria of two names of Hashem. One is Kale, and one is Alev Dalad Nun Yud. <clears throat> As we know, there are, besides the, the names that were known in the Chumash Elohim, and the name uh, Havaya, and Shin Dalad Yud, that's on the Mezuzah, there are certain names that are the, the seven names are the major names of Hashem. But then there are many other names uh, that are known in Kabbalah, and we're not so familiar with them. So one of those names is the combination of these two, Kale and Aleph Dalad Nun Yud. And together, they're Gematria 96. Do my, that's what that Rizal writes. The Gemara says, Ein Tzav el That Tzav actually alludes to Avedizara, idol worship. I know. That means that idol worship, where does it get their nurture from? From the two names of Hashem, Kale and Adnan. And this is the deeper meaning why we every day uh, read the Parsha of the how they used to bring the carbon Tomid in the Beis Amigdash. By reading that Parsha, which starts with the word Tzav, this weakens the power of Avodah Zorah. So when we say Tzav, we are connecting to the name Kel Adnai, and that name weakens the power of Avodah Zorah. Well, the Yipla, this is, it's, it's a shocking, there's a shocking question here. Ma'in Avodah Zorah, L'Shem Kel Adnai. What is the connection between Avodah Zorah, which is idolatry, and a holy name of Hashem, Kael and Alav Dal Nun Yud. Elinyan Hu Kishem Zeh Hashelud Basir. All the different names of Hashem. There's <clears throat> actually a story in the Medrash, which is not Kabbalah, just Medrash. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, uh, all the concepts of the hidden secrets of Torah are found in the Medrash. So in the Medrash it says that when Moshe Rabbeinu was told by Hashem to go to Mitzrayim. He said to Hashem, if the Yidin asked me, what's your name, what should I say? And Hashem said to him, I don't have a name. Tell them, I don't have a name. My name changes according to my actions. When I do this, then this is my name. When I do that, then that's my name. If I'm waging wars, it's one name. If I'm providing sustenance, it's a different name, and so on. What does that mean? It means that the different names of Hashem are a reflection of the different things that are going on and where Hashem relates to. So this name, Kael and Adnai, Hashelet Basir. This is the name that rules. In other words, it gives sustenance to the world of Asiya, the lowest of the four worlds. Shabay Val through this name of Hashem, Nim Shechayis Me'en Sobar Chubaylam Asiya. This is the channel to which the life flow of Ein Sof 
is able to be channeled and drawn down to the world of Asiyah. And this life flow that comes to Asiyah, of course, it's the lowest of the four worlds, has to be hidden in a very coarse, thick garment that you don't see the light of Hashem. Otherwise, it wouldn't be able to lead and relate to a world like Asiyah. And it's so hidden, the light of Hashem, it's so hidden that sometimes something is hidden, but you still sense that there's something there. But over here, it's so hidden that it appears as if everything is operating totally independently, independent of Hashem. That's why we say this name relates to Abu Zorah. This name is the holy name of Hashem. But this name conceals Hashem's light. Through this name, Hashem's light goes through a very um, strong process of tzimtzum, and that enables people in this world to do Avodah Zarah. Shubchin is Hayesh, or Kvira Belakus. Avodah is basically recognizing yourself as an independent entity, independent of Hashem, and denying Gavanis, Leima, to say, Ani the Avsi Eid. This is a, a quote. Um, means as if to say that it's me, I'm everything, nothing else besides me. It's my strength and my power that brought me the success that I have. So it doesn't necessarily mean when someone says that they're denying Hashem, they're an atheist. It means the Karale al Kodalakaya. The Umara uses this expression. They refer to Hashem as the God of all gods. So what does that mean? They mean they believe that there are forces up there that have their own independent power to do things independently. And they uh, believe that Hashem created these forces. And not only that, Hashem delegated this power to the forces. But once he did that, he sort of withdrew himself. And now he's allowing them to function and operate independently. So therefore, they are gods. And what's Hashem's position? He's the God of all the gods. But that is Avodah Zorah. So Avodah Zarah is not only somebody who doesn't believe in God, even if they believe in God, but they believe that Hashem is, gave over independent power to angels or to the sun or to the moon or the constellations or anything else, that's Avodah Zarah. And that's why I would say, just say that Tzav is referring to Avodah Zarah. There are other names of Hashem where it's more transparent. The light of Hashem, when it goes through that, it's so open that there's no room to make a mistake and think that it's not Hashem. But this name hides the light of Hashem. It goes through a very thick garment. What's that thick garment? Nature, the order of nature. So it's an interesting thing, you know, we daven and we say the Shema, a few times a day, we say the Shema in Shachris, we say the Shema at night before going to bed, men who daven Shachris, Mincha, and Mayru, say the Shema in Mayru, and the Shema, there's a piece there that says, be cautious not to worship, Hashem will give you sustenance, your fields will give good crop, and everything will be nice, but be careful not to go ahead and worship idols. So there was a time in history where pe people worship idols. But when we are saying this every day, who's thinking of worshiping idols? Like, what am I supposed to think when I'm saying these words? Yeah. Um, well, last week you were talking about how, like, thinking that, like, nature has its own power and stuff is some type of a bullseye because it's the most. Exactly. Right. That's what I was going to say. So, based on what he says here, if I'm, uh, if I'm attributing independent power to nature to the point that I'm sort of. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm thinking that nature has some sort of an independence, and we'll still see how that expresses itself practically. If I'm thinking that, in a sense, this is a, we'll call it a, a um, in a minor way, it's a subtle way of Avodah Zarah. It's not outright idol worship, but it's a subtle form of worshiping Avodah Zarah because I'm giving, attributing independent power to nature. 
And I'll soon give an example. What does that mean? How does, how does it express itself? If he has the average from Jews, of course I know Hashem is in charge. But if a person says Hashem is in charge, but some things do happen because of nature, which means not because of Hashem, that is a subtle form of our desire. And therefore, where the last line now, 160, even if a person already asked Hashem for his mercy, that Hashem should give him Parnassa, let's turn the page to 163. So remember we said it's not enough just to get Hashem's bracha. We also have to ask Hashem, in addition to that, please make sure that the bracha is translated into physical bracha. So imagine I went through that stage also. I daven to Hashem, she'izgashem sheva chesed elyon, that the influence of this chesed should also be drawn down on Yom Kippur to the material form in this world. Nevertheless, it's still not enough. If he also occupies himself in some sort of business activity, which means that the person has to prepare the garment. So in a sense, what Hashem is saying to us is, I'm giving you the bracha, and your responsibility is to provide the channels, provide this garment that's going to hide the bracha. And through the garment that you're going to set up, <clears throat> that will allow the light of Hashem to be drawn down to the physical world, because then the light is hidden. If you don't hide the light, I can't give it to you. I know, and what does it mean, a garment? A proper uh, source of income. What does a proper, proper source of income mean? It's something that you set up for an income, for sustenance, shall it be teva ha'olam, it has to be something that according to nature, this will enable the person to earn the sum that he needs for whatever it is that he needs. Then it's a good garment that we can say Hashem's bracha is hidden in it. And Hashem will give me the bracha through this garment. This means Hashem is giving me the bracha. The bracha is really coming from his chesed. It's Hashem's spiritual light of chesed that's flowing to me, and it's translating itself into money or food or clothing. And the purpose of this garment, the business that I'm setting up, or the work that I'm doing, is the garment that's the channel that's allowing the light of Hashem to flow to me. Because this garment makes it possible, page 162, it's, it's set up in such a way that you could say this potential to say, that it's not Hashem, it's the, what I did. All the, I did all these things which are the appropriate things to do to earn a living, and that's why I'm making money. And why can I say it? Because that's nature. McCabe you'll soon see why he's elaborating on this. And being that you could, it allows you to say, leaves room to think that it's not from Hashem. That makes it appropriate garment. Interesting. The fact that you could possibly interpret what's happening and say it's not from Hashem, that makes it an appropriate garment for Hashem to give me the bracha. Why? Because this life, this flow of chesed has to be hidden. And this is hiding it. Last line on page 160. Again, you have to check with, uh, sometimes you can't see it at the bottom. So the reason why it keeps repeating this is very simple. Imagine, like I mentioned the other week, imagine if a person sets up a parnasa, but what he set up, Alpiteva doesn't normally bring in an, an income. Like I said, he'll open the store, but he doesn't really set it up nicely, or he doesn't even have a sign that says uh, welcome, or it doesn't uh, bother putting on the lights. I open the store. You know, there's a story of the Balshemto. That the Balshemto once went to a very wealthy man, knocked on the window. It wasn't a window, it was shutters. So he knocked on the shutters and he left, went back to his house. 
the wealthy man goes over to the window, opens the shutters, and he takes looks. He sees the Shem is walking away. He didn't give him a chance to open the door. He just knocked and he walked away. So he quickly put on his coat and he ran after the Hashem to Zugazund, and he finally reached him in his house. And he says, Rabbi, I, I, he knocked on my, what, did, what is it that you needed? Uh, he didn't even come to the door. He didn't give me a chance to open up. So he says, there's a, this in this situation. And I need X amount of money for Tzedakah to help this family or whatever it is. And I, I was hoping that you could help me. And he gave him the money. So the students later said to the what was this thing with knocking on the shutters? If you wanted to make a derech teva keili, you don't knock on shutters. You walk in, you say hello, good morning, and you tell them what you came for. If you wanted to perform a miracle, you didn't have to go to knock on the shutters. You can be in your house, the guy will come and give you money. So why did you go and just knock on the shutters? So the Hashem answered, because you have to make a certain vessel in the natural order, but I don't need a big vessel. I just need a little vessel. So I went and I knocked on the shutters, and that was the vessel. But this is something for the Baal not for a regular person. A regular person has to make a keli that alpi teva, it makes perfect sense that what I did should bring in this income. If it doesn't, then it's not really hiding it. it reminds me of the kids who play hiding or seek. And they go into behind the door and then they're shouting from behind the door, okay, I'm ready. Of course, you find them right away. Or if you go behind a curtain that's transparent, you're not really hiding. It has to be really hidden. So if, if, if a person goes like that and is waiting for money to come in and the money comes in, it's, not, it's a miracle. It's not Dara Chateva. It doesn't hide Hashem's presence. It's clearly from Hashem. So when is it a good lavush, a good garment? Only if it hides Hashem's presence that it makes perfect sense to say, you could say that it happened because of nature. So therefore, I have to do something that in the business world, this will lead to bring the Parnassah. So now he concludes like this. There are two kavanas. That there are two things that a person should have intention when he's doing parnasa. Aleph, page 165. One thing is, he has to turn to Hashem. He has to ask Hashem for his mercy. He should send me his chesed. And this chesed, this gashem should be translated into a material form in this physical world. There's a menu parnasa, that it should have sustenance from this in a physical way. The second thing is, that when he does business, he should have in mind that what I'm doing right now, which is bringing you money, in reality, it's not the business, it's really coming from Hashem, kishar hanisim agluyim, like all other open miracles. Just like Hashem brought down the man in the desert, there was no question in anyone's mind that this food is coming from Hashem because there was no way that you could interpret this, uh, that this is something natural. How does food come from Shemayim? Clearly it's from Hashem. So when I go to work and at the end of the week I get paid my, my paycheck or I do business and I have customers that buy things from me, in all these cases, I have to believe that this is no different than the man. It's coming straight from Hashem, just like a miracle. And the fact that I'm doing this, that, and the other thing is only a garment. And the purpose is to hide Hashem's presence. And why am I doing that? Why am I hiding it? This is Hashem's will. He wants the world to operate in a normal, natural order, ad eskates hayom, until the end of days, which means until Mashiach comes. When Mashiach comes, it says in Gemara, that the earth will produce ready-made pastries. So that's going to be a miracle that right now the earth produces raw material, wheat, and then you take that and you process it and you make pastries out of it. And then it'll come straight out of the ground, ready-made, ready to go. So basically, we have to, this is, this is, by the way, the challenge. If Hashem would say, you don't have to do anything, just trust in me, it's all coming from Hashem. I think that would be easy. Just trust Hashem. 
What makes it hard is I have to do the panasa and I have to do it in a way that it makes perfect sense that this will bring in an income, which means I have to do the marketing, have to get the right material, I have to set up the store in a proper way, I have to make every effort to get customers, and at the same time to believe that all my effort is only a, a garment, it's not the real thing. But that's what Hashem wants, that it should be clear to me that it's coming from Hashem, in spite of the fact that it's hidden in this garment, which makes it appear otherwise. Of course, the difference will be where I will invest myself more. If I believe that, if I invest myself more in the garment than in my relationship with Hashem, that's an indication that I'm giving more importance, priority to the garment than Hashem. That means on some level, I believe it's the natural order, the garment that's giving me the bracha, not anything else. You know, they tell the story, of course, it's a, it's a joke, but it brings out the point that there was once um, years ago and there was a fire, it was a big ordeal. They didn't have the kind of uh, equipment and, and technology which we have today. So very often if there was a fire, half the city could have been burned down. So in the city of Chelem, which is supposed to be a city of foolish people, even though it wasn't, in this city, this is the way the story goes, they sent a messenger, they gave him a lot of money and they sent them to travel to other cities and to see what do they do when there's a fire. And we'll learn from them whether they use the same system. So he came to a city and one city, another city, and finally he arrived in a certain city just in time where there was a fire. And they showed him there's a guy on top of the roof, the highest roof in the city, and he has big drums and he's banging and it's making a very loud noise. And then 20 minutes later, the fire is off, over, and he was like amazed. Oh, so that's what I need to do. He took all the money that they gave him and he bought the most beautiful drums, the biggest drums you can get, and made sure that they make a loud noise, came back home to his city, and he said, I found the solution I saw with my own eyes, how they put out the fire, and therefore, I wanna show you right now, let's try it out. Just light a match somewhere, and I'll show you, I can put it out in, in, in no time. So they lit a match. He got up on the roof with his drums and started beating the drums. He's beating the drums and the fire is burning. He's beating louder and louder and the fire is burning. So basically, uh, with that kind of approach, you know, the city can burn down. But he saw with his own eyes that they were beating the drums and the fire went out. Yeah, but he didn't realize that beating the drums, that was just to alert all the people in town. They made a human chain from the well to the fire, passing buckets of water, and that's how they put out the fire. The drums is only there to wake everybody up. It's only a, a something to alert the people. That's not what puts out the fire. But the difference is, if you're not too smart, then you invest everything in the drums, bigger drums, better drums, nicer drums, louder drums. If you understand what's really bringing the change, then you invest the money in buckets and water buckets and firemen and things and the, and the well that makes it easier to draw the water. This is the real source. So if a person compromises on their davening, on their learning, on their keeping Shabbos, on their tzniyas, which means I'm compromising on my relationship with Hashem, in order to uh, be able to enhance the natural causes for helping me, that means I'm giving more attention to the natural than to Hashem. That means that I believe that that's, that's really nature. And if I'm, and again, it doesn't mean I'm not doing what needs to be done in the natural order. It just means that I'm invested more in that than what's the real cause. So this is what it says in Gemara, page 164. Yarba a person should increase his business endeavors. In other words, if he want to make small, and wants to make more money, he should invest more in his business. And he should also ask Hashem for his mercy, which means you need both. The One without the other is insufficient. But it does say Yarba Be'esek, that means he should invest himself more in his business. So he says, oh, this is what it means. It's in a lemur. A person 
Remember we said that Hashem gives a person chesed. He gives him a certain amount of chesed, a ton of chesed. Now this chesed has to be distributed. Part of the chesed goes for health. Part of the chesed goes to have children. Part of the chesed goes to have a home. Part of the chesed goes to uh, have a happy marriage. Part of the chesed goes to have happiness in general. And you can look at the long list of all the things we wish for ourselves. And part of the chesed goes for money. Here's a person that says, I'd rather have that a bigger portion of my chesed goes to money and less to other things. So if he wants more money, he has to make a bigger vessel. He has to make bigger garments. Then he has to also ask Hashem, he's basically saying to Hashem, I'd rather that the chesed you give me is mainly in money. I want more of the money than the other things. Well, 167. Well, the cholov, but an average person, he's not driven to make a lot of money. He's not driven to be wealthy. All he wants is la hashlim terep nafshiv nafshiv bebeisay. His goal is to bring home what's necessary, the sustenance for himself and for all the family members. Einet zerach la harp is basic okach. He doesn't have to increase. Kameshis bar. There's a shem as will be explained later. He just has to work in order to earn the amount of money that he needs for his family. And actually, if it's a family of two or a family of 10 or a family of 15, depending on your situation, that's the kind of work you need to do. And even if a person is driven to become wealthy, don't think that doing more business activity, that's what's going to make you wealthy. What you need to do to be more wealthy is ask Hashem for his rachamim, for his mercy, that he should send the chesed that was designated for me, Hashem send it in the direction of wealth. He has to know how to ask Hashem for mercy. But most people don't conduct themselves that way. He's not going to put aside all the other essential needs and say to Hashem, I want money more than anything else. Actually, it says in Gemara, in the Shema, we say, love Hashem with all your heart, with all your soul. And then it says, with all your ma'id. So the Gemara says, it means with all your money. And the Gemara says, there are certain people that the money is more important. I mean, if I'm giving away my heart, I'm giving away my soul, why do we have to say with all your money? Because there are certain people that the money is even more important to them than their soul. And we see how people, what they do, what they give up, and how much they invest themselves in, in, uh, in their pursuit for wealth, how they unfortunately neglect many other important things in their life. So the average person doesn't ask for Hashem to give him wealth, which means Hashem, take the chesed that's given to me and direct it towards money, not towards other things. So this person who wants it, he has to ask that Hashem should redirect his chesed. And if not, Hashem will only give him what he needs for now. And for that, you don't have to do more business activity. And Rebu Yasik, and if you do more business activity, it won't help him because Loy Nikzavla Yasir hasn't been allotted for him that amount of money. So therefore, working more when you don't have the bracha is in a way so you're wasting your time. 169 to illustrate this, Baza Yubana Maisima Balshemtuk. This explains the story of the Balshemtuk. Shaba Elab Adam Khoshuk Banim. A man came to him who was a man who had great wealth. But he had no children. And he asked Hashem, and he is about Shem Tov, that he should dive into Hashem, that he should have children, he should be blessed with children. The said to this person, if he's ready and he's willing to become poor, then he can dive for him, they should have children. And the person accepted it. And he had children who were born to him, but Nasa Ani became poor. So what does it mean? I mean, uh, 
Why do you have to be so mean? If you're giving me a bracha for children already, why do you have to take away my wealth? So the answer is, Habashem Tov Rod, Habashem Tov Sor, Chelek HaChesed SheNiktzev Al Nabshei, SheMshichu LeMazeh. He saw the measurement, the amount of chesed that was allotted to this person. And he saw that the amount of chesed that's been designated and been channeled in this person's channel, Lo Yaspik Abonim Vayishayachad. There's not enough chesed that this should give him and provide him with wealth and provide him with the bracha for children. Elo Echad no, only one of them. Up until now, the bracha he had was wealth, so he didn't have the bracha of children. If you want me that want to have children, that means there won't be enough for the other bracha of wealth. Is there a point? Now, normally, you can't do this. Normally, once something is designated, it's designated. And actually, because it was about Shem Tov, and he was able to reach up into Shemayim and do things which are out of the ordinary, he was able to switch. Shehichlib shayi mechesed zeh bonavilayishem. He was able to switch that this money, this bracha, this chesed that was in this track leading to giving me wealth, it should be switched and it should go into a different channel that's going to give me children. And therefore, there was not enough chesed left for the other bracha, which was wealth. In other words, if I'm doubting for something, maybe because of that, I'm going to lose out on something else. <laughs> or, or you're just aimless to doubting because the energy is not channeled to that. Right. That's a very good question. And actually, that's what he's going to say right now. And then I'll explain, I'll give the answer. Oops, we don't have too much time for the answer. Generally speaking, I would say, I don't know that I know the answer to the question completely, but there is a general answer. The general answer is like this. Anything and everything that's in the Siddur, which means that the, our sages um, compose the Siddur, and that's what they said we should all be davening for. There's not a question we're supposed to daven for it. So that's that the food should, the, the, the field should give good crop. I should have food. I should have clothing. I should have health. And all these things that we ask for in davening is Shmon Esra. And I think you'd, be, you'd say that the, the, the thing we certainly could ask for is all our basic needs. I think what we're talking about when a person wants to go beyond the basic. So he might be taking a risk. You know, I don't want to have an ordinary home. I want to live in a mansion. There are people that they looking to have a home that's an $8 million house. Otherwise, they can't really feel comfortable. So they might be getting an $8 million house, but chas v'shalom, losing bracha in a different area. So I guess after learning this mimer, a person says to himself, if Hashem gives me bracha, I'll take it. But I'm going to ask for my basic needs and, and, uh, and the other things, a person has to be uh, true that a person should be careful what they're asking for, because I don't know, my bracha might be fulfilled, but I might be getting what I'm asking for and losing out on something else. As they say to Hashem, Hashem, make sure that I don't lose out anywhere else. It's impossible. I have X amount of chesed. So if the chesed, like I said the other day, it's like they, 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 they'll say that you're getting, um, you're getting so much, this or this, this block is getting so much food. Every family is going to get X amount of food. So if you give one family more than the other, it's going to be less for someone else. That's just the way it works. So therefore, if Hashem is giving me X amount of chesed, I can say, give me a lot of this, and nothing else should become less. It can be. It has to become less somewhere else if it's not the ordinary. So if there's a bracha, we don't find people saying to Hashem, please, please take back the bracha. I hope I'm, good. hope I'm not losing anything. Hashem is giving it to me. I can take it in advance and thank him. But for me to ask for something which is out of the ordinary, so I guess asking for health, asking for a shidduch, asking for children, asking for a home, asking for clothing, all the basic needs of a person, being that it's part of our davening and prayers, that means that this is something which we should ask for and we could ask for. But the truth is, he's going to say in the next piece that actually a person shouldn't be pursuing these extraordinary things of, of great wealth and so on. I mean, there's a story with a we'll finish with a story with the Rebbe Marash that there was a chassid who was a wealthy chassid, and he had a brother who wasn't doing well, 
And the brother, whenever he was in a crisis, financial crisis, would come to him and he'd help him out. He was very good natured and very nice. And one day he said to himself, this is ridiculous. Every time he has to come to me, it's humiliating. He has to beg me and I have to help him. Why can't I just give him a large sum of money? He'll become very wealthy. He'll be able to invest in the business. I'll guide him. And he'll, he'll be standing on his own two feet. But a chassid, before he does something, he goes to the Rebbe for a bracha. I think it was the Rebbe Marash, or maybe it's a Tzedek. And he asked him, I think it was Tzemach Tzedek. And he asked him, is this a good idea? Tzemach Tzedek said, no. He was surprised. He asked him another time. Again, he told him, no. Even though it sounds like an amazing idea. It's not that he doesn't want to give him. On the contrary, he wants to give him a lot of money so he can invest, build up a business, and be self-sufficient. It bothered him because to him it didn't make any sense. One day there was another Hasidic Rebbe. He was called the Velednikar. He was a very big tzaddik. He was known to have open rule, HaKodesh. And he happened to pass that town. So he decided he's going to ask him. And he asked him, what does he say about this idea? He said, it's a very good idea. Aslacha. And sure enough, he took the money. He gave it to his brother. The brother invested the money and he made a lot of money, became very wealthy. I don't know how much time passed, but on one of his journeys that he traveled for business, he went somewhere and made a lot of money. And apparently the wagon driver realized that he made a lot of money and on the way, he killed him, took away the money. And that was the end. So again, when he came to the Tzemach Tzedek and he was very broken, like he didn't listen, Tzemach Tzedek said to him, obviously the other Tzedek saw the bracha that he's gonna make a lot of money. But he didn't see, it's like vision physically. Sometimes you see this far, some people will see further. If you have a telescope, you can see even further. He didn't see the end. But I guess it means the chesed was drawn from Hashem, that he shot a lot of money, unfortunately it was taken away from someplace else. So when we don't know, we don't know. But imagine a person is the Rebbe, and it doesn't make any sense. Why would the Rebbe say no? And the answer is because the Rebbe sees there's not enough chesed, there's something else essential which he needs. On the other hand, a rabbi doesn't usually tell the person, I see this and this in Shemayim. They just tell the person, this is what I suggest. You want to take the advice, it's fine. Sometimes people don't want to take the advice and then uh, the results are not always so great. Okay. We'll stop here and to be continued. Almost finished. Yeah. Thank you, Rabbi. Very Thank welcome. Good job, Tim.